All right. Here we go. We're live, Eric. Welcome aboard. Joining me, everybody, uh, Thursday night or Wednesday night, tasting panel experience number three. Joining me from California. You've seen him on the show before. He could be a bagpiper, but we call him the sniper. <laughs> and now I'm the Scotch Malt Whiskey Santa. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. But no, uh, we do, we do, uh, Bart and I started calling you the sniper years ago just because of your comments. You, you're always in there and commenting, and you just come up with some great, funny one liners, and it's like it, you know, just sneaks up on you, and then boom, you get shot. Well, some of them are great, some of them not so much. Every once in a while, I pull a zinger. My dad told me I was the reason why they don't let donkeys go to college because nobody <laughs> likes a smart ass. <laughs> That could, could be, you, that could be. Could get you in trouble in boot camp a little bit with the drill instructors. Yeah. I got yeah. some little smart aleck comment on your mouth. Yeah, we've been there. I can remember I went to boot camp at probably, well, it was after you, I'm sure, 1988. I was in boot camp, and I still remember a lot of that experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But no, so we've got tasting panel experience number three. We've gone through uh, one and two. This is the third and final release. Uh, Charlie McLean was in the States and they had these little sessions. Members could sign up to and they went and presented them with these whiskeys and they kind of got to pick out, you know, their favorite ones from those oh. tastings. This one, well, let's go through first before we really get into the whiskey. Let's see who's tuning in. We always kind of start with a, with a roll call. We had a couple of early commenters. Big Dog was commenting. Um, Eric Waite, Whiskey Studies, Duke McHale, which is you, by the way, if you don't know Eric Waite, who's joining me as a YouTube uh, personality as well under Eric Waite, Whiskey Studies. Uh, pretty, uh, what I think is a great story was you started as a wine person, uh, was all up in the wine world. And uh, in one of your classes for wine, you had to take a class on whiskey and it kind of really opened the door for you. And now we have Eric Waite's whiskey studies as but i think the the wine studies kind of took a back seat didn't it yeah well it's kind of funny because none of i didn't choose any of this it's just something you you, you know you're i was actually in a seminary student i was at a presbyterian seminary went to a restaurant with one of my brothers tasted some you know looking at a wine menu might have been written in sanskrit or something i not know nothing but you know i just want to i don't want to get into wine just want to learn a little bit about wine so I know what to buy at a restaurant or something like that. So I thought, wow, I should learn something. So I talked to a fellow student of mine. We went out to the wine country and uh, I got the bug. Boom. I fell in love with uh, the beauty of the wine country and production. So it just kind of grew. And next thing I know, I should be studying theology. I'm off in the wine country. <laughs> got some hands-on experience working at a winery. Eventually, after I graduated seminary, Went back to college, studied enology, then learned about the Winesburg Educational Trust, then learned about the Court of Mass Sommeliers. And next thing you know, and with the, when I was studying with the Winesburg Educational Trust, one of the units was on spirits. And so you, you have to get the right essay exam, uh, questions, and then blind tasted. So I bought these little minis, and one of them was the Macallan 12-year-old. Mm -hmm. Now, I was studying with the W set in order to become a master of wine. I had a mentor with the master of wine. And uh, I actually was doing some work for the Institute of Masters of Wine, doing video, stuff like that. And uh, had a McAllen 12-year-old. Next thing I know, I'm off in another direction. I'm on my way to Kentucky to visit distilleries and then go to Scotland, study over in Scotland. I've been to Scotland twice and uh, went to Edinburgh Whiskey Academy, been to 40 distilleries. I'm, I'm now planning, I'm going back to Scotland. I don't know if you heard, uh, in July 23. Oh. So I'll be there for two weeks, and I've been on the waiting list to get into the Springbank Whiskey School, mm -hmm. and I got accepted. Oh, good. So That's I'll be cool. spending a week studying, well, uh, five days studying at the Springbank Whiskey School, uh, which I think would be the best way to learn. You know, you learn, there's book knowledge and then practical knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, working in wineries, you learn more about wine and rather than just from a book or a classroom or a lecture or something like that. It'll be the same thing here, be able to get some hands-on experience. So that I know, actually know what I'm talking about a little, at least a little bit from a practical experience. Really excited about that. But it's kind of like I nothing. It's not like I've really sought things. It's just things that sort of fall into place as you move along. And along the way, the most important is 
you meet some great people. Um, I have a friend who's a an advanced sommelier. He's now also studying spirits, and he's now studying also to become a master of uh, scotch. So we'll be studying together, and I'll be meeting up with him in Scotland as well as someone else. So along the way, you know, we meet a lot of great people who introduce you to things, who invite you to things, and it just opens up opportunities, and it just becomes more of a communal thing. So it's just yeah. a, something that's been absolutely fantastic, both in the wine world and in the whiskey world, and and got to meet people like you and Scott and Roy and Daniel and Rex and me and Bart. You and Bart. What did I say? Me and Scott. Did I really? Yes, sir. <laughs> <sighs> it's been a long day. I can't believe I I, I, did, I did this last time I had you on. Did you? Yeah. A lot, calling, of, people, a lot of people. Bart. <laughs> Jeez. Anyhow. Yep. Anywho. 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 Just uh, go, finish up our roll call here. Brian Baumstein, Joe Combs, um, Steve Balzac. Bird Dog, Whiskey Franco, George G. Cap is tuning in. Mamuka, nineteen seventy seven. Derek Allen, Drew Bills. Oh, Drew is in. Drew from the Scotch Four Dummies. He'll be oh, uh, Four Dummies starting is uh, tomorrow night. We're starting a little. We'll have an announcement coming out tomorrow about some live streams on our channel tomorrow and Friday. All right, cool. Uh, Ryan Mercer is here. Jason Jones, C. Brown, Hoyt Hemphill, The Whiskey Zone, The Whiskey Zone. I don't know if I've seen The Whiskey Zone before, maybe. Um, Northwoods Whiskey Nerds tuning in. Josh Dilworth, Warren Buff. Good evening, everybody. All right, let's get into the whiskey then. I think that's enough of the pleasantries, as we say. Don't mind if I do. This is Tasting Panel Experience number three, a U.S. exclusive cask, 66.202. Sneaky Pete. And I could smell it as soon as I popped the cork. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 13-year-old Highland. Oh, refill yeah. bourbon barrel on this one. Peated category, 59.7% ABV. 195 bottles of this will be available. It's $150 and will be by lottery. Email will come out tomorrow to register. Yep, you got the bottle. I'll show you the color. Yep, here we go. I can actually smell this as soon as I open the box. Yeah. <laughs> even and before you know, I pull the cork. Even before I pull the cork, I can smell this one. Oh, here. really? Yeah. So as soon as I open the box, and I, there's this deep down, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Like, oh, uh, back to the color, though. 13 years, refill bourbon uh, barrel, and uh, just kind of what you'd expect, really. Low, low um, impact, I think, by the wood of that refill bourbon barrel. And just uh, probably get a good look at the, the distillery character here as well. So it has sort of a shiny gold, but there's also just a slight tinge of green, depending on the angle you're looking at it. Hmm. And I've noticed that in some of the Isla distilleries that don't use any chill filtering or it added coloring the bourbon cast. It's yeah. Sauvignon Blanc can have that as well. You know, I'm always going to bring in some wine. Sauvignon Blanc can have that slight green uh, tint to it, but it's sort of a pale gold with a slight tinge of green. Mm -hmm. So what we have on this one, though, as well, is this was, uh, I think, that received the highest scores in the tasting panel experiences, and so it became the the third release that we did because it got the, the highest scores from the people that had, had attended uh, those tastings. And so distillery 66. So a while back, um, I think it was last year. As I get older, I lose track of time and it can feel like it was six months ago. And it turns out no, it was actually three years ago. Or sometimes I confuse names. It just happened as I as I yeah, get older. Yeah. You know, but I did a like <laughs> several months study of Highland peated whiskeys, and I wanted to compare what are, are distinctively what's distinctively different about Highland peat. Then there's about Island Pete. Uh, and one of the things I discovered is there's a lot more peated whiskeys in the Highland than I perceived. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, yeah. You know, when you think peated whiskey, your brain may, may immediately goes Isla because they're the most well known for it. But it seems that with a few exceptions, almost every distillery is making some peated whiskey. It might not be on the market. You might have to go to the distillery in order to get it. 
Um, but you know, like Glenn Morangy doesn't do peated and stuff like and McCallum rarely does a peated, but yeah. a lot of them do it. And but you have to either be up there or some ex exclusive, you know, release or something like that. But Distillery 66 does a peated whiskey as part of their core range. And I was actually comparing it uh, last night, but they do peat a little bit different than a lot of other distilleries. Um Typically, if you want to control your PPM, your PPMs, you just you can either uh, burn a little hotter. If you burn hotter, not as much is sticking to your peat. Um, you can just not peat it as long. Or not, basically, you adjust the way in which the peat is going out. This distillery blends peated and non-peated barley to get to where they want with the with with, with the peat on it. So they do about an 80% peated and 20% non-peated to get it right at the level, at the uh, moderation of level of uh, peat they yeah. want on this one. Yeah, and you're talking on their core range bottle. but uh, And then also, but Distillery 66. So a lot of distilleries, especially in the Highlands, they kind of do special editions or, you know, once a year they fire up. Right, right. Distillery 66 traditionally does peated whiskeys in the right. Highlands. Yeah, right. And the, sorry, I was gonna say, I was just gonna get into the nose. Did you have something else? No, I was gonna say, one of the things I like about this is one of the challenging things when I was setting Highland peat it is a lot of them, one, a lot of them don't reveal where they get their, their peat from, but a lot mm -hmm. of them are getting their peat from uh Port Ellen or something like that. So it's really, really challenging to tell the difference between them and an Isla peat, but this one, it. it if they're not getting their peat from the Highlands, it's uh, excuse me from, from 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 an island. It definitely comes across something distinctively Highland um, regarding their peat because it doesn't. For me, I'm not getting like seaweed and the briny character and you know that that that's right. something you expect from some more of the I I Isla distilleries. It's more. Um, like uh, like a dried grass character I get on the nose. So actually, I was going to say, because I hadn't looked it up, it, it, anybody that doesn't have the malt whiskey yearbooks that come out each year, very, very handy. But no, uh, 66 actually sources Highland peat from um, St. the Saint, or Saint Fergus is where they get their peat oh. from. So there you go. You got you got yeah. in the book. So sometimes and th that information can be challenging to get. Sometimes it's yeah. not on the distillery website. It's not on the bottle. So you need to find some other reliable third source. So that's excellent. Yeah. And that's what I thought when you started to say that, you know, a lot of times you don't know where their peat comes from. I was like, no, uh, Distillery 66 puts it out. So, yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Because so some of them, I would send them an email and they wouldn't tell me. They wouldn't even respond. Right. But this is excellent. So this is a class, if for no other reason, this is a classic example of what a Highland peat is versus uh, an Island peat. Whether you're talking Orkney or you're talking... Um, uh, Isla. Uh, very nice nutty. The nuttiness, though, on the nose was like the first thing that I thought. And it almost blind, I might confuse this with Distillery 53. <sighs> yeah, it's a nuttiness. It's not quite peanut butter. It's maybe a little bit more towards almond, maybe marzipan a little. But yeah, that nuttiness is definitely, I get that on the on their 40 ABV core range at one as well. Yeah. Nice, uh, just nice citrus, sweet, fruity notes, vanillas. Almost could be like a uh, one of our juicy, o a peated juicy oak and vanilla bottling if we did one of those. Wow. It's almost a, a, a non-lit tobacco character as well, like a dry leafy character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, yeah. Malty, grassy. A little vanilla, sort of dried apple, dried pear, maybe a little dried peach, also on the dried fruit notes. Josh Dilworth is asking if there's any toffee notes. Not necessarily. I, 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 wouldn't, I don't know if I'm getting any on the nose. It's been a long time since I've had toffee. I'd have to, I need to get some to remind myself what toffee is. Oh, Heath right. Bars. Heath oh, Bars. Are there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Heath Bar, I remember. Now, yeah, Heath there Bar, you go. I just think that, that toffee in there surrounded by the yeah. chocolate. I can always, well, I love toffee. 
Woo. But no, great nose, jumps out, jumped out of the bottle, jumps out of the glass. I, it was jumping out of the box even before I pulled the cork. <laughs> this one showed up. And maybe the where maybe the warehouse people were helping themselves to a little bit. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. All right. Ready for the palette? Ready for the palette? Sure. Cheers. Mm, mm. Slanja. Mm. Wow. Really a delayed react. The, the nuttiness shows up on the back end, but it was like probably like 10, 15 seconds into it. And then it goes to bang on the back end. Mm -hmm. So it's got a real nice transition to it. Get more of the dried fruit notes up front. Ooh. So Ooh. this is so this is called the sneaky sneaky Pete sneaky, sneaky Pete. Pete, and there's a sense in which, and I just experienced the Petey character sneaks up on you, and yeah. it shows up on the on the back end, but it's a very moderate, well interwoven Pete, but a very non oceanic, non you know island character. So it's almost like a toasted. It's almost like a toasted smoky character. Yeah. Toasted nuts. Toasted nuts. <clears throat> At first, I thought uh, really industrial. It was almost like coal uh, peat, mm. coal smoke. Uh, and it kind of reminded me of some Campbelltown peated whiskeys. But dry ash, after after mm. mid-palate to the finish, it turns into a, a dry, you know, campfire type ash. Yeah. And then um, Alex Insminger here has a good question, I would say. He's not sure if it's true, but I've read that 66 often ages in refill casks from one or more Isla distilleries owned by the same folks. That's a, I mean, that's interesting. I don't know if anybody has any other information on that or not, but. I don't know. I don't know. So I have in this glass, I poured myself some earlier to try to. And you can see it kind of got cloudy there. It got cloudy a little bit there. Oh, yeah. To bring it down. So I put a couple of teaspoons in it, and it's been sitting in here for a while. So I want to sort of compare the two. So this is at 59. My goal was to get this one down to 46-ish a little bit. Dan Swank has a good question, too. He says, I just wonder how expensive are the bourbon barrels getting? I don't know if um, if they would see that much of an increase because, you know, if you think at any given time, like Jack Daniels has over a million barrels aging, you know, in there. Is that is that the number? Is that right? That's what I want to say. I think they do have. Matter of fact, I think that was the number I'd heard at one time. You can just throw it out there. No one's going to fact check you. Thank oh, you. No, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I think when you look at the, the quantity of bourbon that's being made and the the number of distilleries that are in the in the used bourbon barrel business, I think there's probably still plenty to keep up with demand. I don't know. I don't have the insights on that. But so there's 90 percent of the barrels and warehouses in Scotland are bourbon bourbon barrels. Uh, and that's a somewhat recent phenomenon over coming up over the last 100 years or so. Um before that, it would have been sherry and other wine wine casks. But I think bourbon has nowhere else to go with their casks. Mm -hmm. um, as long as they don't change the regulations on the requirements for bourbon casks, um, and bourbon is so popular right now, I don't see that there would be a shortage on bourbon casks mm -hmm. for, for Scott producers. The real challenge would be is if there's a new oak shortage or challenge or transportation challenge here in, in the United States. I think it's more of an issue of the transportation issues than it is the tree yeah. issues than the right. tree. Yeah, probably so. Um, yeah. Uh, third sip there on that one. I mean, it really is a very nice palate full. I mean, there's just nice peat. There's nice citrus fruits in there with it. Nuttiness, grassiness. Ashiness, very, very nice palette, front to front to back. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. We'll fix that. There we go. All 
Oh, there you go. <laughs> Joe, so uh, I, I was wrong with the million barrels aging. Joe Combs points out they have around 2 million barrels of whiskey aging in 90 rack houses on 3,000 acres. Big dog in, he says, Scotch lovers owe a great debt to us bourbon guzzlers. <laughs> wow. Changing the glass does change the way in which the whiskey goes into the palate. It seems to be focusing it more towards the center of my palate and not spreading up to the rest of my palate as quickly. Um, it seems slightly, just slightly sharper and more, more acute. But doesn't necessarily radically change it, uh, the profile of the whiskey. In in in, in wine, the, the Riedel Company makes a gazillion different uh, glasses for wines from Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir, yada yada yada, and those make a huge difference with the wines. Yeah, but I'm so accustomed to just grabbing a, a Glencairn. They do all kinds of research and testing and everything with all the different kinds of wines and then create a, a glass just for that specific type of wine. Riedel. There, uh, let me get a drop of water on this one. I, I like I like the palate on this one. Neat, man. It is a, um, there's so much going on with it. Just so much, like I say, the sweetness, the fruits, the peat, nuttiness. One of the most interesting thing is the way, so, so whiskey... You know, peated whiskeys, you can have a whiskey where right up front, the, the, the peat really hits you, the smoke really hits you, and you have to kind of dig through to get to fruity notes and other kind of character, and much of what you get is just peat, 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 peat. And I've had other whiskeys where the peat sort of frames it. It's almost like um, the peat is on the outside on the palate, and then the fruits run right down uh, the middle of the palate. Um, in fact, the... the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottling I have from uh, this is a time travel. This is um, a Boomore, seventeen year old. That's super juicy right up the front, and then the peak kind of surrounds on on the outside of this one. Yeah, I find this one the sneaky peak. It's it's moderately smoky. For me, this is how I perceive it in my mind. And then it shows up more on the back end. So it said, or you get a little up front, but then it really says hello on the back end and into the finish. And that nuttiness uh, carries in there. But I get most of the fruit up, up, up front. Yeah. Water, I think, brought out a little bit more of the nuttiness up front, really made it hit right off the bat on the palate. More oak showing, more of that toasted okay. oak. But still, it's, I would still, I mean, this is literally, it's like a peated, juicy oak and vanilla profile. A lot of vanillas in here as well. And, okay, some of the toffee showing as well. Milk chocolates with the water now, yeah. bringing those out, I think. So, if you're, if someone's a peated fan, you know, if, unless you just want to listen or taste, listen, like listen to the same band, same song all the time. Dun, 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 dun. But if you, you if you want a variety of peats and smoke and experiences, then there are different styles of peat. They're all I think they're all great. I'm a big peat smoke fan. But this one fits in a particular slot that is unique, and there aren't a lot of peat ones like this. Mm. Um, you know, so say like an Ardbeg 10, okay, Lechek 10, pretty comparable. Uh Port Charlotte 10. You know, pretty comparable. I like the Port Charlotte 10 more than they did Ardbeck 10, but great, both great whiskeys. A little bit of the wine cast in the Port Charlotte 10, but they're closer together and and, and more grump, uh, more lumped together in terms of the way that the peat and smoke is hitting you. This one is so very different. It's so, I can't think of another whiskey that's peated and smoky that has this type of profile. It's such a moderate level of smoke and peat and it's framed different, uh, that it just really stands out. So, such that if you tasted this one up and then you had it in a blind test, you'd be able to pull it out because it's so distinct from all other peats. Whereas if you gave me an electric 10 on a blind taste, I could mistake it for an Ardbeg 10. Huh. You know what I mean? You know what Interesting. I mean? Um, this one is just so very, 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 very unique. So someone's a peat whiskey fan, 
and they wanted to develop a, a, a selection of different styles of peat uh, in their portfolio, in their library, or in their collection, then this is one that's going to fill a unique niche that no other peated whiskey is really going to fit that sort of profile. And I'd come in, I really like this one neat. I really like it with the drop of water on it too. It's all, it's just really extended the finish on it, kind of really opened up the mouthfeel even and just kind of let everything dance around. Mm. Wow. But I think this also, I mean, let, let's get real. Sky Small Wasting Society, very unique cast, very unique bottles, one of a kind. What they come and go, and then they, they're not they're not there again. People who are whiskey drinkers, they just go to the grocery store, look their corner liquor store, grab a bottle off the shelf and buy it. They probably never even heard of the Scotch Mall Whiskey Society. These are those who are really on the whiskey hunt to find to find bottles. If you wanted to introduce someone to a peated whiskey and they've, they, they're like, oh, and all they've ever had is some of the big, boisterous, in-your-face, briny, medicinal iodine peats, this would be a really good one to introduce them to. Uh, and it, it it's really turned up the volume uh, um, from the core range peated whiskey from this distillery, and yet with a similar peated profile of I can't, can't say it of the of that distillery of, of the core range if, if you're familiar with it. Right. It's just a very in a class by itself kind of whiskey that's just really 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 nice. Yeah. And uh, Christmas is coming up, so either for yourself or for a loved one. If, if they've been good. <laughs> I would say with water, the citrus is almost turned more kind of um, stone fruits, almost more peaches and apricots. Yeah. Yep. So, so this we, one, I've got water in that. I would say the same thing. I've got water on this one. <laughs> it also brings the smoke a little bit more up to the front and not just a delayed in, uh, on the back end. You were talking, Eric, just about, you know, the, the one-off casks and you get this whiskey and how unique it is. And then, you know, it's, it's sold out. You know, we've got uh, 190, 195 bottles of this and you can't get it again. I've really come to accept that that's the beauty of the SMWS. It's one of those things, you know, it kind of teaches you to appreciate the whiskey. You know, you drink it and then you move on and there's always good whiskeys coming out. But then you might be like, hey, you know, five years from now, you might be like, you remember that sneaky Pete? And like, oh, yeah, that was a good one. Oh, yeah. You oh, know? yeah. I think it kind of teaches you just to really appreciate the whiskey. And then, uh, like you say, some people, you get your bottles of of McAllen 12, and that's what you cling to, and you keep buying, and yeah. it's consistent, uh, and it's good. But then you can get sneaky Pete. Yeah, and I'm always about exploration, trying something new. I, I don't know if I necessarily get bored with the same thing, you know, very quickly, but I quickly want to move on and try something new. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, obviously you mentioned at the beginning of the show. Uh, yeah, I still have wine once in a while, but in all my studies of wine and exploration of wine, and I was just living up, I was just living out on the golf course out in the wine country, and I, I didn't go out wine country out to the uh, the wineries because. Been there, done that. You're kind of moving on, exploring something yeah. new. And that's the thing is the Scotch Mall Whiskey Society is not only have something new in terms of the casks, and I mentioned this before, is I've counted at least 31 distilleries that mm. I will never see anything from those distilleries in my market or available here in the United States. And some of them don't even release their own bottles, period. So the only way you're going to, I mean, I am going to be able to explore those 31 distilleries is through the Scotch Mountain Whiskey Society. And there's no yep. better way to get, get them. So I have, you can't see it, but I have now uh, a shelf right there and there's two rows in, uh, in which I'm just filling in uh, for the Scotch Mountain Whiskey Society. And I have a hutch that's going to be built over there. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> there you go. That's my Scotch Mountain Whiskey Society. And there's two layers there. And I've got room for probably one, at least another layer there. Yep, there you go. That's my scotch my always society layer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even I, so I put a second drop of water on this one. Still, water is definitely, I get a lot of slack for this, but water is definitely not hurting this one at all. 
Uh, I am going to go back. I still have a little bit neat here. I poured off to the side. I'll try it. I've had several sips of it with some water. I'll go back and try it neat. And yet, you know what? So this is 13 years old. It's 13 years old. I would say in comparison to the um, distillery release bottle, that's at 40 ABV. Not only is this, you know, it's a big oomph in, in terms of intensity of flavor, but I don't think that one, because there's no, it's a non-A statement one. I don't think it's got 13 years on. This okay. one is showing its time in the cask on it. Yeah. But the inter- now, obviously, you know, we taste whiskeys all the time. And so it's like, if you listen to loud music all the time, you can kind of become, it doesn't really seem all that loud. Um, but I would say, I still today, there's some whiskeys, particularly if they're younger whiskeys, that if they're this high ABV, uh, they're challenging to approach. Yeah. It, you know, you, you're really not going to drink them at cast strength uh, because, because it's such a big bite. It's so it's such a hard attack on the palate. This one, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. I, 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 I don't get a big bite. I don't get a big sting. I'm not getting a big burn. I'm not getting I'm not getting like a lot of heat, uh, you know, in here and so forth. Uh, I'm tasting it je- neat, perfectly just fine. Yeah, you know, it's del- yeah, it's delicious, neat. And yeah. real, real, I mean, when you look at the color of this though, and it's a refill barrel, and you think, okay, there's going to be uh, very little influence here. There, I mean, I would say the palette on this far exceeds what you would expect from the color of that. You know, yeah. I mean, there's so much. The, the, the flavors and the notes and the peat, the fruits, all that stuff, the nuttiness that I'm getting. When you look at the color of that and you think, no, there can't be that much in there. You're wrong. There's a lot. So I love it. Yeah, it looks younger than it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It looks younger than it is and it tastes older than it yeah. is. It, it, yeah. There's no. So one of the things that, that casks do and time does is soften the hard edges and bite of of the spirit and so if you got more age on it you can drink it at a higher ab or taste it at a higher abv because it's not going to have that sort of tack on the palate and even though that's only quote unquote 13 years old it's matured really really nice it's very approachable Mm -hmm. at this ab at this abv you know so it's, it's really really nice yep uh, JT is asking, am I reading the small print correctly? This will be a lottery bottle. Yep. Just like the other tasting panel experiences. Mm. So we've had way more people put in for them than we've got bottles. So we do that when we have bottles that we think that, you know, demand is going to exceed, um, stock on hand. So it's a safe way or, a a, uh, um, a, a fair way to do it just to ensure that everybody gets a chance at it. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's it'll run through. The email will come out tomorrow on Thursday. Uh, you'll have till Monday the 5th. Yep. To uh, enter if you want to be uh, registered for a chance to uh, buy this bottle. So you have to. Oh, so you can't just go buy it. You have to register and then hope you get one. Yeah. Ooh. Yep. All right. So so if you've been. So if you really want one and it depends. Santa's going to check his list. But you've been naughty or nice, and he's gonna check his list, and maybe you'll get a little help from Santa. <laughs> <laughs> get a bottle. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Eric, uh, the sniper. You could be a bagpiper, but you're a sniper. I'm a sniper. <laughs> check out Eric Waite, Eric Waite Whiskey Studies on YouTube. Thank you for joining me, Eric. I know you're busy and uh, had to carve some time out for us here, but appreciate it. And I think you got a great. Great palate, great sense of uh, knowledge and everything that comes with the territory. So, hey, for me, Christmas just came a little early. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, like they say, uh, remember, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society whiskeys are not for swigging, glugging, or knocking back. Please drink responsibly. Cheers. Sanja. It's on the back of the bottle. Thanks to everybody that tuned in.